Right, good morning everyone. Welcome to today's class. Um, today we will be talking about um, introduction to sports governance and also we will also talk about uh, policy developments. So today's class, uh, let's look at agenda first. So we will start with introducing sports governing body first and also talk about what is sports governance and what are the good governance in the sports industries. And then we will have time to talk about um, how we're able to develop a policy and using that policy to develop a standard that can be utilized in the sports organizations. So today, today's class will break down into two lectures. The first lecture is we will talk about basic concepts associated with the sports governance. The second lecture is we will talk about um, how we are able to develop uh, policies. So in the first half of the semester, uh, we actually spend time to talking about sport administrations. Basically, we look at our sports organizations from our manager's perspective, think about how we are able to create a budget, how we are able to manage a, a crisis, how we are able to develop um, a recruit our employees. Right, so in the second part of the, of the semester, we'll be focusing on sports governance. Um, Try to refresh your memory a little bit. A uh, few, few days ago, we were talking about the organizations, right? Anyone still remember the definitions of the organizations, right? So we talk about in the second lecture, right? The organization is basically the entity that allow a group of two or more to work together effectively in order to achieve a goal. So the organizations are basically, we emphasize um, this is a collaborations between members within the organization. And the reason we like to work together is because we want to achieve the goal, right? And so today we're gonna to introduce another concept, it's called governing bodies. So what is a governing bodies? So a governing body is a group of people that has authority to uh, exercise governance over uh, organizations or political entities. Well, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples that has been considered as uh, governing bodies. So from an international perspective, um, some of you may have heard about WTO, which is World Trade Organization. So what is a World Trade Organization? Their goal is try to promote free trade um, through um, all their different types of policies. Basically, if a country decided to join the F uh, WTO, they will have to agree to lower their tariff and they also can enjoy the tariff benefit from other WTO's members. So the purpose for having the World Trade Organization is try to promote free trade among different countries, different members. Right, so that is uh, one of the examples about WTO. And also another example is the WHO, which is World Health Organizations. So the purpose for, for World Health Organization is to develop uh, food security standards that the entire world can follow. Right, so look at the governing body, their job is actually to develop a policy and standards they can allow all the members to follow. When we look at the national level, we have um, FDA, which is the US Food and Drug Administrations. So, so FDA is actually part of the departments of the Health and Human Service. So the purpose is to protect public health through control and supervision of the food safety and tobacco products and animal foods and feed. So basically, if you're going to introduce a food-related product, brand new food-related product to the markets, so um, FDA will have the right to oversee whether the food you provided to the customer is healthy. It's actually, the goal is try to protect the public's health. Right, so this is the governing bodies. So in the sports industry, we also have a lot of governing bodies. So in the sports industry, the sports governing bodies is a sports organization that has a regulatory or sanctioning functions, right? So when we look at international levels, anyone can think about examples for the international sports governing bodies in the world. Right, some students may remember the IOC, which is International Olympic Committee, right? So their goal is to oversee the Olympic movements in the world. So for instance, if you are an athlete who are competing in the Olympic sports, so, so you say you want to represent USA to competing in the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games, so you want to know how, 
I'm able to qualify for the Olympic Games. So IOC is basically set a broad standards to uh, define who actually are able to participate for the Olympic Games, including winter and summer games. Right, another example is FIFA, right? I think a lot of students know about FIFA, it's an international governing body for soccer. So FIFA is overseeing like, the development of soccer in the world. Um, also overseeing one of the most important sporting events in the world, which is the FIFA World Cups. So if a national team wants to know how I'm able to qualify for the FIFA World Cup, so they will have to go and follow the rule introduced by FIFA. Right, so this is the uh, international level of sports governing bodies. I also have a national level of sports governing bodies. Uh, one of the examples um, is um, U.S. Olympic Committee. Now it's called U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Right, their job is basically selecting the Team USA to compete at the Olympic Games. Again, so we talk about if you are the American athletes, the swimmers, you want to know uh, whether you can compete at the Olympic Games and all that represent the United States. So those rules are actually decided by um, the U.S. Olympic committees, right? Um, another example is NCAA, right? It's also a national governing bodies. So they oversee how college sports has been developed uh, on the national levels. So um, if a uh, university, so they want to become a uh, NCAA members, so they have to follow all the rules that has been introduced by the NCAA. So those are national levels of sports governing bodies. We also have a local levels of sports governing bodies, including uh, OHSAA, which is Ohio High School Athletic Association. Right, so they basically oversee the rules in the state levels and uh, for all the school districts. Uh, which are their members, they have to follow all the rules they have been introduced. If they want to participate in the state level championships, they have to go and follow the rules and schedules and procedures that have been introduced at the state levels. Right? So we have three different levels of governing bodies existing in the sports industries. Uh, we talk about sports governing bodies that are also related to governance. Right, so, the, which is the second part of the semester, we'll be focusing on governance. So, what is sports governance? So, governance is a structure and a process used by the organizations to develop a strategic goals and directions to monitor its performance um, against these goals and also to ensure those poor at in the best interest of the members. So, this is definition has been introduced by Australian Sports Commission in 2014. Right, from this definition, you understand that like, governing bodies, right, their job is they will have to introduce different kind of rule, policy, standard to make sure um, all their members can follow. Right, the purpose for them to introduce this rule and policy is try to make sure um, the operations of the sports industries is fair, um, also uh, make sure all the policy we introduce uh, reflect the value and culture of the organization. And also they try to enhance transparency, uh, make sure um, the policy they introduce can provide a very fair treatment to every single member that has been involved into the entire process. Right. So those are the um, sports governance. We'll give examples. The NCAA does in introduce athlete eligibility rules. Right, so those rules give people the idea so if you want to become the athletes, um, college athletes, so what kind of rule do you have to follow? So what kind of GPA you have to reach? Uh, you know, how many courses have you been taking? And you know, so they have a lot of different types of requirements. Right, so these are one of the examples. So all the decision you make, um, have to make sure you ensure um, uh, is brought at the best interest of the members because every decision you make, um, a lot of stakeholders may have to be impacted by the decision you make. So make sure every time you make a decision, um, you are making a decision to protect the best interest of the most of the members. We'll give you an example. Uh, when rents relocated from St. Louis to Los Angeles, this decision obviously is very controversial. Um, the decision needs to be approved by the MFL. So when MFL made a decision, they have to consider um, the impact of decisions from many different uh, stakeholders, including all the investors, all the owners, uh, how they think about this decision, right? how fans think about this decision, how local community will have 
um, think about this decision have sponsors and even teens interest right so when you're making that decision you having the rules having the policies can really help you to make the decision quicker and also really help you to um, enhance the operations of the business right so this is about sports governance um, the next topic we'll talk a little bit about is the diversity of the governing structures. Uh, we talk about we have different levels of the governing bodies is sitting. We have international level, we have a national level, we also have a local levels of sports governing bodies. And also we have to understand like professional sports, how it has been developed in the US, in Europe, in the rest of the world are really, really different. All these governing bodies um, that create are based on their own um, history, culture and values. Right. So um, Governing, governance structures are various um, between these organizations. Uh, when we look at professional sports league as examples, right? So one of the biggest difference between professional sports league here in the U.S. and in Europe's, um, uh, most of the professional European league, particular soccer league that we're talking about here, they're using promotion and relegation, right? Some students, if you follow English Premier League, you possibly know what the promotion and relegation is about. Right, so promotion relegation is basically talking about in most of the professional soccer league in Europe, they have more than one league, unlike professional league here in the US, that you have MFL, you have only one league, right? But in Europe, you have multiple different professional leagues, they're connected with each other. So the team perform the worst that will be delegated to the lower divisions next year. So the team perform the best and the second divisions will be promoted to the upper divisions every year. So basically every year, um, English Premier League every year they have 20 teams, but they don't have the same 20 teams over and over again. So the team perform the worst will be uh, de delegated to lower divisions, right? So they, the members will be changed. That's how promotion relegations system has been used um, in Europe. And the benefit of using promotion relegation is enhanced competitions. Right. Um, so for the team on the first divisions, they all want to you know uh, stay in the top divisions because you can share more revenues, you have more benefits. Right. So those are the policy has been utilized by uh, professional sports league in Europe. When we look at in the U.S., we don't use promotion relegations uh, because we only have one professional sports league, so promotion relegations not existing. But we also introduce our own. Um, policy which is really different has not been utilized in Europe's like for instance we have a territory right so if you um, have a professional sports team in this area you can only promote this team in this area you cannot really promote in team in a rivals area right so this is a territory right right and also we have a salary cap and we try to prevent the team spend so much money on player salaries uh, the purpose is also we try to minimize the gaps between um, all the different teams because some teams definitely have more advantage over the other team, right? The team from New York City is definitely have a lot more advantage compared to the team from Cincinnati because New York is such a big market, right? Yeah, a lot of populations here. Yeah, a lot of business there. You have a lot more like uh, marketing opportunity and sponsorship opportunities. So it's definitely they have a lot more advantage over the other cities, right? So the market power is big. So they're using salary cap and those kind of policies um, to try to balance and uh, the powers among all their members, right? So you have to know about governance structure are very different between organizations, and also the role of the countries gov governments in the sports are very different. So we uh, we have like two hundred uh, nearly twenty countries in the world, so. Um, like we're using Canada as example, right? Canada, they have their Ministry of Sports. So basically in their governments, um, they have a one particular department that really oversees how sport has been developed in, in Canada. So all the sport um, so developments has received funding from the state governments, right? So this is the scenario in Canada, as well also the scenario in majority of the countries in the world. Right. Uh, we also have some countries like in the UK, so uh, sports governing bodies are within the Ministry of Education and Culture. Right. So it's actually pretty interesting things about the UK. It's before 1996, um, UK, uh, how they developed sport, they did not, uh, UK government did not fund any money to support their sports. However, at the 2006 
um, in the 1996 Olympic Games, um, the Team GB um, only received a one gold medals, uh, ranked number 26 in the world. So at that time, they decided to start use public funds to invest in sports. So they create a sports lottery and use lottery um, revenues to fund the sports. So how sport has been overseeded, so they have a governing body that's associated with the Ministry of Educational Culture, and then using that as a platform to oversee how sport has been developed in the UK. Right, in the US is actually kind of unique. So sports development in the US has never received any funding or support from the federal governments. So US OPC, which is United States Olympic Paralympic Committee, is a national governing body for developing all different types of Olympic sports in the US. Um, actually, um, they did not receive any money from the federal government. So all the money they receive are from the donors, sponsors, and other partners, and using that money to uh, fund and support sports developments here in the U.S. So in, in the U.S., we have the White House Office on the Olympic and Paralympic and your sports, but they don't uh, really um, oversee the how sport has been developed because they don't put any money in it, so they don't really oversee. They only provide some sort of suggestion sometimes. Right, so you have to understand and most of the country, the government's involvement in sports are also very different, right? So those are examples for uh, interpreting the diversity of the governance structures in the sports industries. Uh, we talk about sports governing body. All the sports governing body, they all have the regulatory powers over its members. So they have the ability to enforce rules and also impose punishments if necessary, right? Using NCAA as examples. Um, NCAA has uh, about 1,200 members, right? We know NCAA based on um, the, the demands of the uh, institution, classify all the institutions into three different categories, right? Have different Division One, Division Two school, and Division Three school. And also in D1 school, about 340 institutions, right? So also based on their need, they have FBS school, FCS school, and also for about 100 schools, they don't sponsor football at all, right? So they based on them. So all the different divisions and all the different divisions have a very different requirements, right? So they set the rules. So if the institution do not follow the rules that set by the NCAA, they might lose their memberships. Right? FBS school maybe um, will be delegated to the FCS school. They lose their memberships if they don't follow that rules. So for all these sports governing bodies, they do actually have the regulatory powers to force its members to follow all the rules they introduced during the process. Okay, so those are basic concepts about governance. So how can we define whether there's a good governance or not? So based on the textbook, we talk about five R, which are good governance, right? Regulations, rules, rankings, records, and results. So those are pretty easy for us to understand. Regulations um, is report organizations governing structures, right? Like constitution, selection criteria, code of legibilities, uh, conduct and ethics. It's like uh, about regulations. I'll give you a couple examples about regulations. So for, um, uh, if you go into so basically, the regulation talking about we have a policy and rules that has been um, implemented to or enforce the entire system. So we'll give you an example. Um, so for the IOC, every time when they select the Olympic hosting city, right? So um, if the city say I want to bid for 2032 Summer Olympic Games, what's the procedure like? So IOC will have to these regulations, right? Introduce those uh, basic criteria so what kind of city can be qualified for bidding for 2032 Olympic Games what is the procedures like right so they actually have that kind of rules right the second one is a technical rules technical rules um, the second R is rules right is a technical rules of the officiation and management of the respective sports competitive events right so We'll introduce a lot of different types of rules. Uh, one of example, uh, we're pretty familiar with uh, all those for sport uh, for, uh, follow this rule, uh, introduced by WADA, War Anti-Doping Agency. So what is WADA? So what do they normally do? So WADA 
um, is the place where they introduce a lot of different types of the doping rules. So they introduce the rules of how, when uh, these athletes will receive um, the doping tests. And, and every year they will also update those drug lists and let people to know how, what kind of medicine the supplement now has been considered as performance enhanced drug, which means if athletes using this performance enhanced drug and failing a doping test, so they will receive some sort of punishment. So although also the rule of the punishment also has been introduced by WADA as well. Right? So those are those rules. Right, so uh, WADA was a war anti-doping agency. So majority of the sports organization in the world, um, as long as you um, associate with the Olympic movement, so you will have to follow all the rules that have been introduced by the WADAs. Right, and that's a WADA is a international governing bodies. Right, in the U.S. we also have the USADA. So their job is basically follow the rule has been introduced by WADAs in the U.S. Right, so during these doping tests, uh, doping tests, so um, they have a very complicated rules uh, in terms of doping tests. Right, if you fail the doping test, um, some athlete may say, "Well, I have never used any performance in head strap. There must be some mistakes." So, um, so you don't agree with the decision made by WADA, you can also go to CAS. Right, CAS is here. So CAS is a core of arbitration of sports, so which is the highest the um, court in the sports in the world. So if you don't agree with the decision made by WADA, you can appeal it at CAS. So CAS will make the final call on whether this athlete should be banned from using the performance enhancing drugs, or these athletes you know, can just get rid of these punishments um, if that's possible. So those are rules and regulations um, indicate two very important elements in sports governance in sport, um, good governance in sports. Another five, uh, three R's including ranking, record, and results. In the sport, you know, rankings basically report the performance based on the result and the competitive criteria, right? When we follow professional sports league, you know, we look at the ranking every week. Right, record uh, basically is the record the best performance ever accomplished by the athletes and the teams. So we have different types of re record. Right, if you watch a track and field competition, you have what record? You have American record, you have state record, you have venue record. So we record the best performance ever accomplished by the athlete and the teams. We also have a result. Result is we finally report the final standings and the performance. Right. The reason people follow sports is because we care about the result. Right. So um, result is also a uh, 5R of the good governance in sports. So we have a regulation, rules, ranking, record, and results. Um, the next section, I uh, will talk a little bit about the organizational unit existing in the sports governing bodies. So technically we have five different uh, sports uh, organization units. The first one is the General Assembly, and then Executive Committee, and then we have Standing Committee, we have a whole committee, which is also called a Temporary Committee, and also we have Executive st Staff. So General, uh, General Assembly is basically is the greatest of the powers um, in the sports governing bodies. But a lot of time, we also think Executive Committee is the real power because most of the decision and most of the policy has been introduced on these levels, right? Standing committee is basically we have a committee that oversees something on the regular basis. A whole, a whole committee is basically that we have to deal with things immediately, so we need to have a temporary committees, right? Executive staff is someone who mainly responsible for the day-to-day -day operations. Okay, we provide little explanations here. I think the textbook provide a very good explanation. I just help you to have a quick summary here. So General Assembly is a Congress, sometimes we call it Congress. So it's a primary governing bodies that usually convince on a regular basis. So for the General Assembly, they meet every year. So once a year. And the members including President, Vice President and Secretary. And all those members, normally they are volunteer. Right. So how this member has been selected? So normally based on the sports governing bodies, uh, constitutions, and by law. Right. So this is about general assemblies. 
um, and some different organization may call it differently, right? FIFA, they call it Congress, right? That's a primary governing body. Usually, they meet once a year making those major decisions, right? Um, that's, that's, uh, and then is the executive committee. Executive committee has also been called in the different names. Some people call it governing boards, right? Some organization call it councils. So it's a group that's selected by a general assembly that has been considered as a real power in the sports organization. So this member normally is a broadly representative. So here's the link. You can look at uh, executive committees. Um, that has been called FIFA councils, right, uh, in the FIFAs. So you look at the links, uh, you can see in the FIFAs councils, they have uh, members for all different continents, right, and also have women count, uh, members involved in making sure um, the decision the may at the executive committees um, actually represent um, the broader interest of the um, organizations. Another three types of the organizational units. First one is a standing committee. So they are assigned with the specific responsibilities. Right here, I'm showing you FIFA's standing committees. Right, you look at all the different committees, they are doing those um, jobs really have a very specific focus, right? You have development committees, right? They're mainly responsible how soccer can be developed in the third world country, right? You have a medical committee, right? Obviously, obviously, uh, all this medicine research, and you have an organizing committee for the FIFA competition. You know, FIFA not just have a World Cup, also have a women's World Cup for different age groups, World Cups, right? Beach World Cups, beach soccer World Cups, right? So. That they also have the organizing committee to oversee these events. They have referee committees, you have finance committees. So all different committees, they all have that specific responsibilities. A lot of times they also have a whole committee where they are set to deal with the short-term basis and interests and rules. So for instance, if an organization want to recall a CEO, so when they want to recall a CEO, they may would like to have um, search committee, right? So this search committee is a temporary, right? The reason we have the search committee is because we're currently recruiting a CEO. So we just have this temporary committee for a very short period of time, right? So when the CEO search is over, this a whole committee is no longer existing. So they normally set to deal with the short-term purpose and need and the issues, right? And the last one, as we explained previously, executive staff, they are mainly re uh, higher by the sports organization to run the daily operations, right? So this is about a uh, different organization units. So one last topic for the first part of lectures, we talk a little bit about constitution and by law. Those are two very big legal documents has been utilized by sports governing bodies. So what the difference between constitution and by law? The constitution normally indicate the core principle and values. They allow members to have a better understanding of what this organization is all about and how it functions. So if you look at constitution, normally a lot of statements are pretty poor, um, not going to give you a lot of things in detail. If you really want to get to know more about specific rule and detail, you have to go to look at by law. So they establish specific rule and guidelines by which the group is to function. For instance, uh, we're using uh, MFL as example. If a city said, I want to bid for the Super Bowl in 2025, right? So, um, so Constitution might actually let you know a little bit about the process, but the bylaw will actually will let you know more about their basic requirements. So in order to organize or bid for the 2025 Super Bowl, what will be the requirements? What kind of facilities looks like? How many hotels do we need? What kind of transport do we need? How much money you will need? Right, so they will have a more in-depth information if you want to know more about uh, how to bid for the Super Bowls. Right, so Constitution only give you broader information, help you have better understanding what this organization is about. And basic principle, right, by laws give you more in-depth rules and guidelines. So those are the difference. Okay, so this is the first part of today's lecture. In the second part of today's lecture, you will be know a little bit more about what is a policy and how you're able to write a policy.